people are coming in. I've been asked to let you all know there is no flash photography during this panel. Feel free to take photos, but please do turn your flashes off if you're taking flash photos of someone is going to come and give you a warning and a couple warnings, I guess you're going to be out. So don't give up. Um, other things about the panel, I'm going to do a very brief 15 minute uh, moderated discussion and then as far as I'm concerned, these shows are for the fans. So at that point I'd like to hand over this thing to you and you guys are going to line up in the middle behind that lovely Edmonton Expo volunteer in the blue shirt, she's waving her hand. And he's going to ask one brief question and then let someone else go up and ask their question. We'll try to get through as many as we absolutely can. And now, I don't think this lady on stage with me requires any introduction. You may know her from The Walking Dead. You may know her from Risen Brick. You may know her from Teen Street or Tarzan. Or any of the other 20 plus credits on her IMDb TV page. Sarah Wayne. I thought it was really funny to like sneak up behind me and go, blah. <laughs> and walk. 
watch what would happen. But it would, like, shut the set down. Because <laughs> I would be shaking and I couldn't think straight and I couldn't remember my lines. And so at a certain point, the producers went to the extras and they're like, you guys really have to stop effing with her because she can't take it, like, psychologically. And where we were shooting, we were kind of up on a hill, and at a certain point, our uh, producer, Denise Hooth, turned to me, and she's like, you look uncomfortable. And I was like, I had to pee for four hours, but I'm too scared to go to the porta potties <laughs> So John and Norman walked me to the porta potties and made fun of me the entire way back. Um, and that fear never really went away. I had my last nightmare about four months after I finished the season three. So that leads into my next question. Um, obviously, shooting it is very, very intense, and it keeps you in a very intense emotional state the, the entire time. How do you, what did you do at the end of your shooting day to kind of shed that and come back to, you know, Sarah you are? Apart from drinking healthy. Um, <laughs> well, uh, it's a great cast. It's a really, it's an amazing group. I've never worked with a group of people with more heart and dedication. You know, it's, it's easy. If we'd all gotten together and decided to do a zombie show and kind of wink about it, I think it could have been really lame. Um, but it started with Andy Lincoln, and we all showed up on set, and he had a week working by himself, going crazy, throwing a beard, screaming at things. And he came with this incredible level of commitment and of courage to play it as though it were completely honest. And that's hard to do because if you fall on your face, you make an idiot of yourself. You know, sometimes you can, you want to hold back from that because people will laugh at you and Andy never cared. He was like, we're going to do this as though it was absolutely real. And so everybody kind of followed suit. Um, and it was the kind of job where you left at the end of the day and you were exhausted and you stank. You smelled like sweat and blood and bug juice and whatever had bitten you during the day, whether it was a tick or a snake or 50 million mosquitoes. Um, but it was a good feeling because you, even in the first season when we thought probably no one's going to watch this. Um, <laughs> thanks, by the way. <laughs> So speaking of those uh, emotional and difficult moments, because The Walking Dead is absolutely full of them, um, which was the most challenging to shoot for you and the rest of the cast? What was the one that weighed toward your soul to? Has everyone here seen season three? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Because Norman and I did one of these at one point, and like 10 people in the audience lost their minds. <laughs> was the one, I mean, before I came back looking like in a dress and makeup and stuff. It was way harder, I have to say that. I mean, the hardest thing was standing there in a clean white dress and not tearing it or throwing up on it or something. And the lipstick was super weird. Um, but I mean, the scenes that were my like, sort of real last scenes in the show with Carl were, were absolutely the hardest. Um, because I just love that kid. And, you know, we had this one day where the day Dale died in, in season two, it was the first kind of big family loss, right? Because, you know, there were those of us who were the pilot, and we were all really, really close. We'd get together and have barbecues on the weekend and stuff. And I looked out in the field in the middle of the night as we were shooting this, and Chandler was just standing there alone. And I went, oh, he's just a kid. Because he was then. Now he's like a little man. But, you know, he was like 10 or 11 at the time. And I just went up to him, I was like, how you doing, buddy? And he just kind of leaned on me, just started shaking his head. And I said, well, you know what, it's okay, you got me, you got Andy, we're here for you. And he goes, yeah. And it really wasn't enough, because he knew that, he knew we were losing John in the next episode. And then I found out I was leaving, and I thought, I kind of told this kid I'd be there for him. <laughs> So someday his therapist will be able to blame me for all kinds of things. <laughs> um, but leaving Chandler, this remarkable young man that I'd seen grow from a boy to 
one of the best actors I worked with, that was that was incredibly hard. And he was a pro for the whole thing. He was a total champ, but um, we couldn't really look at each other for most of that day. Now, you've already had the obligatory spoiler warning, so I'm not going to shoot again like you just did. Your character, Lori, dies in the comics. Now, was there ever any thought of perhaps giving her an ultimate fate in the TV series, or was that always in the cards to follow through that way as well? Well, Darabont and I argued about it a lot. Um, my position from the beginning was that you have to kill Lori, because killing Lori does something to Rick that you can't do another way. And Frank didn't agree with that. Um, his mind, you know, certainly wasn't made up, but for a long time he would sort of take his devil's advocate position of, you know, there are these other ways that we could put stress on Rick and, and break them down. My response was always, sure, but then Lori would be there to build the back up. Um, you know, there were times where she wasn't particularly good at that <laughs> in the marriage. But, you know, I, I did feel pretty strongly that the series starts with him looking for his wife and his son, and you have to take his wife away in order for him to kind of go down that path. Um, you know, so when Glenn came on board, it was the first thing I said to him. There was talk about her making it longer, and you know, at one point they had this idea that like Lori would give birth in the woods alone in a snowstorm fighting off zombies. <laughs> and I was kind of like, yeah, or that could be us jumping the shark. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I think the way she died made sense, and I think. You know, I hated to leave the show because I love the show, but you take a job on a show like The Walking Dead, you know, my numbers are gonna come up. And I think the show loses all of its teeth if it feels like there are sacred characters that can never be killed. And when you lose people like Shane and you lose people like Lori, what you tell the audience is every time someone's in danger, someone's really in danger. And I just think that's so important to do to the story. If, if Lori made it 10 seasons, I would have been upset about it. All right, I'm officially giving you guys your two minute warning. So you can start thinking about lining up with your questions right about now. Wait, and kindergarten class with me. Yes, it is. <laughs> Hold hands, find your partner. Um, and I'm going to ask for a moment. And I'm going to actually flip away, from, flip away from The Walking Dead for a second. Um, I was looking at the IMDb when I was uh, coming up with this stuff. And I noticed that you have a new thriller in the works called Into the Storm that's coming out next year. Did you want to tell us what you can about that? Give us a little bit of a... What is that? Yeah. Um, well, it was, it was directed by uh, Stephen Quayle, who did Act 5. Oh, it was Act 5. Um, and it's a story about uh, a town. It's another story in which I'm going to spend most of the time almost dying. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you how that ends. Uh, but I have made a career dying. Um, I, I really honestly have. My mom is really, my mom wants me to do like a CBS comedy. <laughs> like about roommates in a really safe city or something. Um, ponies and rainbows. So Into the Storm is it's a found footage movie uh, about a tornado that threatens a school and a group of people who come together to try and save that school. So in a way, it's a similar kind of post-apocalyptic world, or at least before the story, after the story, rather. It's a post-apocalyptic world. Um, and I probably can't say too much more than that. It's, it's me and Richard Armitage, who, uh, as it turns out, is really tall. <laughs> For those of you who've seen The Hobbits, he plays Thorin Oakenshield, the, um, the king of the dwarves. And when I met him, I was like, no kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Peter Jackson is really incredible with him. Uh, he's a marvelous actor. We had a great time shooting that in Detroit. And that, I think, comes out on the stage, that one I say. And you know, uh, Sean Bean has pretty much made a career out of dying on screen. <laughs> and everything he does, you could come. Oh my god. Yeah, I, I could do worse. I could do worse. <laughs> All right. And now it's time for you guys to take over the show. So let's have some questions. Um, I heard a rumor that you were moving to Canada. Is that true? 
It's not true. <laughs> I moved to Canada seven years ago. <laughs> I live in British Columbia. <laughs> Canadian citizen, I've got my residency, so, you know. Hey, uh, my question was, uh, when Lori met her untimely end, did they tell you in advance that they're going to have the ghostly hallucinations, or had you already started looking at new roles? Um, so, it's a good question. I... I shot the last scene thinking it was the last scene I'd ever shoot on The Walking Dead. Um, my death dinner was a couple days later, scheduled. Uh, I started this tradition of doing death dinners for everybody who gets killed off the show, first season. Um, and then all of a sudden I found myself planning my own, which was <laughs> kind of depressing, but, uh, but boy did we have fun. So, there's a, there's a little place called, oh, I don't know the name of it. We call it the Roadhouse. It's like a little southern dive bar at the end of the street where we shoot. And we had shot Lori's final scene. My trailer looked like a crime scene. There was like chunks of belly and blood everywhere. <laughs> I'd said goodbye to the crew and the cast with this terrible thing. They're like, okay, we're all gonna go to the Roadhouse and celebrate properly. And I'm in my car, the phone rings. It was Glenn Mazzara. Um, who I had asked not to come to set for that final scene because his mother had just passed away and I just, I was like, you can't be here. Don't, you know, don't be a hero. Uh, so, you know, he was calling and picked up the phone. I said, hey, Glenn, it all went well. He goes, well, <clears throat> about that last day thing. <laughs> and I was like, I can't take this. Not right now. <laughs> like, my emotions are right here. I just gave birth. <laughs> you gotta cut me some slack. He said, we're thinking of bringing you back to flashbacks. And I think I said something like, I don't want to know about it. <laughs> like, you call me when, you know, when there's a real script and it's for sure. And I, the initial idea was that Lori was going to come back as a zombie in the dress talking to Rick. And between Gail and her and Denise Hoot and myself and I think Nicotero, there were a few people who were like, we can't have a talking zombie. We can't do it. First of all, the prosthetic teeth. <laughs> you literally can't speak. But it wasn't, it just wasn't an idea that made any sense. And so then we started thinking about those flashbacks because Rick has all those hallucination phone calls and stuff. Um, so at the time I shot it, yes, I thought that was the end of it. And then I shot the first flashback, and that was supposed to be the end of it. And then I shot that. And so I kept coming back, and the crew was like, how many times do we have to throw you a party to say goodbye? <laughs> it got very anticlimactic. Thank you. But it wasn't my fault. <laughs> so my initial question was actually going to be about comparing your career to Shaw Beans. Well, we already covered that. I didn't understand a word you just said. Sorry, my, my initial question was going to be comparing your career to Shaw Beans. Oh. Well, we did already cover that. We, we covered that. Yeah, so my question is this, like... I will sit on the Iron Throne. <laughs> when, when you've read through the, read the graphic novels, and you know, you've, you've been playing part in the show, what parts do you like that they changed the graphic novels, and what part did you like? Let me just make sure I understood you right. What parts do I like that they changed, and what parts do I didn't like that they changed? Yeah, compared to the graphic novel. Compared to the graphic novel. Um, that's an interesting question. Uh, I've put the graphic novel so far out of my head, there's a lot that I don't quite remember. I think, I mean, I don't mean to pander, but I do think adding the Dixon brothers was a bit of a story of genius. Um, I gotta say, I think Frank Darabont had something pretty cool going when he came up with Daryl and Girl. I think that's right. I think Sophia coming out of the barn was tremendous. I think those are those are incredible. Um, I love Morgan, Morgan and Dwayne. They're a big part of what I love about the pilot. Uh, I'm novels, but I don't know that that's possible at this point. Um, I, I kind of want to keep thinking about that and if more comes 
to me all. I'm also kind of reticent to say that there's things I don't like because I love everybody who works on the show and I don't want to piss them off. <laughs> to be honest. So I'll, I'll give you the positives. And yeah, I think, you know, Daryl and Merle's feel coming out of the barn. I also think what they've done with Carol is absolutely tremendous. I think Melissa McBride is one of the best actresses on television right now. I think she's in season four, you are going to lose your minds. Like, I mean, <laughs> if there is any justice in the world, Melissa McBride will walk away with every acting award known to man after what she's doing this season. It's tremendous. <laughs> Looking forward. Thank you. Frank was talking about doing a flashback 
episode, obviously that never happened, but to the time when Rick was in the hospital as the apocalypse was kind of coming along. And uh, I hear you, I feel the same way, kiddo. <laughs> um, and we were talking about, like, what if they're just at soccer practice? You know, Lori's got the minivan, she's driven Carl to soccer practice. Rick's there, he and Shane swing by in a squad car, and kind of off in the distance, there's just something kind of weird going on. Like one or two walkers sort of shamble around and nobody really knows what's going on and somebody thinks that they're, I don't know, just sick people or whatever and goes over and they get bit but they don't think about it and, you know, hustle them into the squad car and they leave. I mean, I think there's, I read, a, oh, what was it called? Uh, the Colson Whitehead book? Anyone can help me out? It's, a, it's the, the book that he wrote about the zombie apocalypse, it came out after World War Z. But it's all about the quiet ways in which people find out about things before it's 7,000, you know, zombie hordes pushing over a, you know, knocking into a mall. It's just one guy walking in the middle of a church. And everyone comes up, what's wrong with that guy? I think that's an interesting way to lead it in, too, with a group of people who just kind of go, well, this is a one-off, this will never happen again, in a small town, and then you hear, you know, anybody hear what happened in Atlanta? I don't know, I heard that there was something in a hospital, and that kind of a thing, that kind of a snowball. I think that's another interesting way to do it, but I also think what Kirkman did was pretty bloody perfect. <laughs> of the, the three seasons, and they were interested in exploring what would happen if she was held accountable for those things, and then threatened, and then, you know, it would be Michael, of course, that would come and break her out. So they just sort of truncated that into that two-hour, uh, into that two-hour DVD, and that's... You know, they just they didn't want to throw out their great ideas for season five, so they just smushed them into two hours. Did they cool costume? Everybody look. Everybody look. Hi. Uh, I noticed uh, during season three, Lori Gordon mentioned that there were some fans that were giving her a lot of harsh criticism because they couldn't separate her from Andrea. Did you ever experience that, and how did you deal with it? <laughs> you know. So, not being a comic book or horror, and I didn't really know this whole world, right? So season one, I go to San Diego Comic Con to promote The Walking Dead, and I'm playing Lori. And like the second interview, I could draw you a picture of this guy if I could draw him. He was a, a, an online journalist, and he goes, so Lori's a total bitch, how do you feel about that? <laughs> and I was like, I beg your, who, what? <laughs> hey, I'm Sarah. Like, this is the weirdest. He was furious. This guy was so mad at me. Arguably because his girlfriend cheated on him in high school or something. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> this had nothing to do with me. Um, but he was really angry about it. And we did this 10 minute interview where I kind of just trying to take on board his emotional baggage. 
And it was my introduction to realizing that this was, that people's reactions to The Walking Dead and to Lori were maybe gonna be more intense than any other job I'd ever had. And that people were gonna take it personally. And on the one hand, I'm kind of honored by that because it means that the work I'm doing matters enough to somebody that they're getting all riled up about it. Um, I, I think most grown-ups, <laughs> right? You know where I'm going with this. I mean, I'm an actor. I do this for a living. I, I didn't create the comic. I didn't write the words. Um, but a lot of people got super mad. <laughs> My job, I can't play a character and not like them. <clears throat> I, I, maybe some people can, I'm just not good enough actor. I, I just, I gotta find something to love and connect to. I think Lori's amazing. I think Lori's a heroine. I think Lori's a human who's made all kinds of mistakes, but you can say the same thing about any character on the show, and that's what I love about the show, is there's no good guys and bad guys. There's flawed people and more flawed people. Um, the way I kind of dealt with it was that I didn't read anything online, and I didn't engage with that. I don't have a Twitter thing yet. I mean, MySpace, Facebook, and whatever. I'm kind of in like the 19th century when it comes to all of that. Um, I'll be honest, there are times when I'll hear about things that people say, and it's, it's hard to remember to have a thick skin. You know, there are times when it's like, dude, ouch, I'm a person, and you can be mad at Lori, but Sarah didn't sleep with her husband's best friend. Like, it, it just <laughs> I, I swear. Um, you know, but I get, you take the good with the bad. I mean, people care that much because there's like 10 million people watching the show, and that's great. I just hope people know that I'm an actor. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hi there. Uh, big fan of uh, Prison Break, and uh, I remember that you had a really big role in the first, second, fourth season. But in the third yeah, one, it's it, it's like you were barely there. You get like some fuzzy shots from behind you, and you're kind of changed to a chair or something like this. And I just kind of wonder. I mean, they could have put a wig on anybody, in it, you know, it could have posed as you or something. And I wonder, was there a was there a reason? Were you she on was like pregnant. sabbatical or, or something like this? <laughs> so. uh, I was in rehab. Okay. <laughs> uh, they actually did put a wig on anybody. I'm not in a single frame of season three. Um, she was pregnant. I did a little bit of voiceover for it eventually. Um, you know, there's a lot about this that I can't really talk about. I got pregnant in season two. Um, we couldn't really work out the logistics of that, so they uh, they wrote me off the show. Um, and, you know, I had a baby and moved on, and, uh, and then, God bless them, to their everlasting credit, the fans kicked up a huge fuss, and they got me my job back, and I got a call, I swear to God, on April 1st. <laughs> <laughs> Why they didn't wait 12 hours, we'll never, ever. They called me, and they're like, hey, we'd like to invite you back for season four, and I was like, I don't know that that's in great taste, but it's really funny. <laughs> They're like, no, we want you back for season four. I was like, y'all killed me. You put my head in a box. And they're like, yeah, we're going to say that was someone else's head. I was like, okay, well, <laughs> sure. Um, so then I came back for season four. Um, and, and that's just how all that happened. There's so many things that happen that are out of our control as actors. <laughs> So many, and that was one of them. But it was also, I mean, the upside of it is it was, it was something that I'll never forget to the day I died. The idea that the fans cared enough about that character to write and call in and kick up such a fuss that Fox Television did a 180 and decided to take my dead head out of a box and stick it back on my neck and give me my job back. I did think about doing all of season four with a scarf. <laughs> they wouldn't let me. <laughs> Thank you for the spotlight. <laughs> what now? 
thank you for the spot. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> Feels weird, doesn't it? <laughs> kind of. Um, I'm a huge prison break fan, um, and I just have a personal question for you. Of all the characters on the set, there's T Bay, who's the psychopath, there's uh, Haywire, there's all these crazy people, but of all the characters, which person was uh, the most different from their act or the person they were acting to their real life character? Oh, that's a really interesting question. The most different from their character to their. I mean, just in his own defense, I want to say Rob Pepper, right? Like, he's not a pedophile. <laughs> he's just not. Pepper's a really good guy with a son. Um, who's a really good, normal, not messed up kid in any way. Uh, Silas Mitchell is also a really lovely human being who's not at all batshit crazy. Um, or, well, we're all batshit crazy. I mean, he's not haywire crazy. Um, you know, Wentworth isn't the kind of guy who'd ever pick up a gun. So there's some real truth in that. Wentworth's one of the most peaceful, uh, quiet, reserved, private people I know. Um, Dom's pretty much Lincoln. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Dom's Lincoln. So I guess maybe he's the outlier. Everybody else is pretty different, <laughs> but Dom, Dom's Lincoln for some. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So good. And who are you? Uh, my name is Tiffany. I'm just one of those cheap people. Maybe I'll be here or work with that. No, one more time? I'm, uh, I'm from an avenue. Okay. okay. Sorry, what's your question? I'm totally clean. Um, <laughs> I love what you did in The Walking Dead, but you have me back. Okay. And I was wondering, kind of along the same lines of the long hair question, where it's like, you know, the scene that just tore you before you inside. I was wondering what that scene would be for a prison break for you. I didn't hear all of that. What would be for prison break? Um, like that scene that just totally tore you up inside. Oh, the scene that tore me up inside. Um, man. Um, you know, I. I kind of want to say the scene at the end of season one where Sarah realizes that Michael's been lying to her mm. the whole time. You know, I mean, you have, the thing I thought was really cool about the first season of Prison Break from my character's perspective is Michael's going through this life-changing, crazy madness. Lincoln's going through the end of his days, possibly. Veronica's trying to save them. For my character, it's just another day at the office, right up until the moment where Michael tells her that this has all been a lie, and where she realizes that this whole, I don't care about this guy, I don't care about this guy, I don't care about this guy thing, didn't work at all. Um, and that was, it was a hard scene to play, partly because, you know, as an actor, you kind of think, oh, you'd be so emotional, you'd be screaming and yelling, and blah, 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 I'm tearing your hair out and crying. And then we got there on the day, and everything just went cold inside. Um, and we found that it was a really quiet scene, where, you know, it's just somebody standing on the beach watching a tsunami coming towards them, not able to turn and run. And, uh, I think that was it, because everything that comes after, from that moment on, she's prepared for, because this is now a man who's capable of anything. But in that one moment, he takes the mask off, you know, and she kind of goes, oh, you're not Bruce Wayne. <laughs> you're not Batman. This is terrible. Um, yeah. I'm going to stick with that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it must be my ears. 
Uh, a 180 character change at the end of season two? Yeah, in season two to season three, they overlap, like the winter oh. that the characters go through. Yeah. Uh, everybody goes through kind of a big change. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, Tyler Ray's been just kind of more going up, and Lori over the draws. And I was just wondering if uh, the actors have problems kind of showing that, or they just kind of naturally. You know, I, I think actually as actors, it was a really exciting thing because the danger of television, and as an actor, my fear with television, is you get locked into the same character, kind of doing the same thing over and over and over. And I think in the last 10 years, television's changed a lot. Um, you know, thanks in part to shows like Breaking Bad, where you've got a character who really goes from the angel to the devil over the course of the, the seasons. But you... You still get nervous that, oh, I'm going to be locked into playing this one character a certain way. And with season three, the writers called us in, you know, kind of one at a time, and they said, you've gone through, this is your apocalypsis over the time that you've been off count. Um, obviously, mine was physical in addition to everything else, but I thought it was a really, really smart thing to do. It's also what we have to do with Chandler because you turn your back on him and the kid's going to be growing a beard, you know? I mean, he's, he's growing up super fast. We had to account for the fact that he was like no less than three inches taller um, when we started again. But it's, it's kind of great because I think it, it's shorthand to the audience. You guys don't want to see every single second of us going through every single second of survival. You do want to jump ahead and see, well, what happens? What happens in a world where the zombies aren't that scary anymore? It's the attrition of exhaustion and malnutrition and the strain of living this way. Um, I, so I thought that jump ahead was fantastic. And uh, without giving up too much, but what are they gonna do, kill me? Uh, <laughs> season four has uh, some of those elements too in ways that are, I think, really cool and really profound. Hi Sarah, not so much of a question, more of a statement, um, I'm a rock and dead fan. Um, I just want to thank you um, for the job that you've done for the three seasons. Uh, you've done a fantastic job and I think I speak for everyone here. Uh, we'll very much miss Laurie, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Back at you. I mean you can talk to anyone on the show. This is the best job any of us have ever had. Scott Wilson's been in this business one of the world years, like, like <laughs> 40 or something. Jeff DeMond, you know, I mean, these are seasoned actors, and this job has meant more to us than anything we've ever done. And we're only doing it because you guys are watching. We thought if we could hit a million viewers, they might let us come back for season two, and then that would probably be it. Um, you guys took our breath away. So thank you so much for the support that you guys have shown the show. It's amazing. I have a question to refer to the prison break. So how does it feel like for you to be playing as Dr. Sarah as Sarah? <laughs> Is it a coincidence? It's a total coincidence. I begged them to change it. <laughs> I begged them. Just because it's helpful to know when someone's walking up to you on the street, that they say, hey, Lori, I know to turn around with, I'm about to meet a fan, I don't know face. But if they say, hey, Sarah, I don't know if it's a friend, or a stranger. <laughs> and I went to Paul Sharing, who, who created Prison Break, and during the pilot, I was like, listen, man, you know, can we, let's give her any other name. And he played me like a fiddle. He's like, yeah, but Sarah's the name of a woman with such courage and loyalty and strength. <laughs> you sucker. <laughs> so, yeah, that, that's, that was all there was to it. At least there's the H, no H difference. I mean, I don't know that that's really gonna sell, but, you know, I got nothing, man. It was just a coincidence. <laughs>
tricks in the getting into auditions uh, that we could share. Yeah. Tricks in the audition process? I mean, here's the thing. I've been cast in two series that I've been really, really lucky to get. And they've done really well, which is more luck. I've probably auditioned for 200 other jobs <laughs> that either I haven't gotten or I've gotten and they haven't been great. Um, you know, I've been in pilots that haven't been picked up. There's a lot of fairy dust in this business. And I love what I do. I believe in what I do. I'm kind of a fanatic about it. I think storytelling is sacred. I think every culture throughout history has storytellers and I think it's a beautiful thing to be part of. But I have no ability to pick a winner. <laughs> um, my husband's pretty good at it. He read the scripts to both Chris Brayton and The Walking Dead, and he said, I think people are going to love these shows. I just kind of like, eh, I don't know. Um, I think I tend to get cast when they're looking for a regular girl. You know, when they're, and I, I, this is no false modesty, like when they're looking for the bikini to be in the hot tub they find someone else. <laughs> um, you know, there's... I don't know, I mean, the only... Advice-wise, I don't think I'm in any position to give any. I went to a grad program, you know, I got a master's, I trained for three years doing Shakespeare and Molinger and um, Mamet and all of that stuff. Maybe it helped, it was great fun, and it certainly made me a better actor. Um, but I think a hell of a lot of it comes down to fairy dust. Thank <laughs> you. 